Brian Livingston is an executive fellow at the University of Calgary, and he has written a series of memos on the federal government's emissions reduction plan for the C.D. Howe Institute. So I'm going to interview him about all four of those in separate interviews. So if you're watching this one, you keep an eye out for the other three as well. Brian, welcome to the interview. Glad to be here, Markham. Now, I'm I'm really uh, interested in your work uh, here, Brian, because there's been a lot of talk, a lot of political chatter uh, about emissions reduction and the federal government's plan. But to my uh, knowledge, this is the first time that anybody's really delved into the numbers by sector. And today we're going to be talking about transportation. So maybe let's start this conversation off with a, a brief overview of transportation and the emissions reduction plan, please. Will do. Uh, there's going to be some numbers. And uh, as a former engineer, and I like data, and as a former lawyer, I like evidence. So both of these are in the report that I did. There are about 186 million tons of emissions in 2019 from the transportation sector. Now, people think of transportation, they think of the cars they drive, they think of the light trucks they see that other people drive, they think of the freight trucks that they see going down the highway, the 18 wheelers, they think of aviation, marine, rail, and other. And so the three sectors of cars, light trucks, and freight trucks comprise over 80% of that 186 million. So most of the work that I did uh, focused on those sectors for the simple reason that that's by far the, the biggest share of emissions. Right, and what are the, uh, this transportation is often seen as the easiest to decarbonize because uh, electric vehicles uh, are becoming increasingly competitive on price. They're already competitive on total cost of ownership per kilometer, but that doesn't mean that that electrifying the transportation is going to be easy, does it? No, and if I can summarize in two words, or one sentence rather, the issue for electric vehicles is a supply issue more than a demand issue. There are just not enough manufacturing facilities today, and even in the next seven or eight years, to make as many electric vehicles as the, the, uh, the emissions reduction plan that you mentioned contemplates. They contemplate uh, an increase to 60% of, of sales in Canada being electric vehicles by the year 2030. Uh, some of the numbers I put together shows that that will be less for the simple reason that it takes a long time to build um, manufacturing facilities and factories to build electric vehicles. Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. And even though there have been a number of announcements in Canada uh, about EV plants either being built or some of the existing automakers of uh, converting their auto plants into EV manufacturing plants. I mean, we've only got what, uh, maybe three or four, maybe five, uh, you know, in the works. And by the time they get up and running and turning out EVs, even with imports, and it's not clear where those imports would come from my point of view, because, uh, you know, other countries are struggling with exactly the same issue that Canada has. But even if we assume all of that, we've only got maybe what, three or four five years at most, to solve that supply issue. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the, the big issue. Today, as we speak, in the year 2022, we're going to produce about 80,000 uh, electric vehicles in Canada uh, for sale. That, that's how many are going to be sold in the year 2022. My forecasts say, well, you're going to have a, a number of uh, facilities. You mentioned those Ford's going to have one, GM, Stellantis. Uh, others are going to be importing vehicles for like the Hyundai's from Co South Korea, uh, some from Europe and so on. That will increase to about 310,000 or so by my forecast by the year 2030. And I, I have a chart that I, I put together, which you may be able to show, that is what I call a layer chart. It shows the buildup of vehicles and it shows the Teslas and all the other manufacturers that I've described and how many vehicles uh, it's realistic to assume will be produced in the next uh, uh, eight years and by the year 2030. And even once we start buying electric cars and trucks, that's we still have to turn over the existing fleet. What are the numbers there? Well, there's a chart that I put together. Again, you might be able to show up that shows there's about give or take 12 million electric, sorry, 12 million cars and 10 million light trucks uh, in Canada in the year 20, around 2020. And the light trucks include not only the pickup trucks, but also the SUVs and the crossover vehicles. And Canadian consumer uh, preferences have shown that light trucks 
are by far the largest amount of uh, vehicles that are being sold. The cars themselves uh, are dropping tremendously. So uh, I have another chart that shows about 1.65 million vehicles sold. Of, of that, only about 330 or 40,000 are actual cars, the traditional four four door sedans uh, that uh, people drive, families drive. And the other 1.2, 1.3 million are crossover vehicles and light trucks because that's what people are trying to buy. And for cars, yes, there are the Teslas that we see on the road. There are the uh, Hyundai, uh, I think it's Ionic 5, some Chevy Bolts and so on. Uh, and there will be a number of those cars and there'll probably be 150,000 of those vehicles uh, in 2030 that are electric as opposed to the 330,000 sales. So almost half. So that's getting close to the 60% figure. But for light trucks, it'll be it'll be less than that. There'll be only about 150,000 electric vehicle trucks, light trucks sold. And that's in a, a sales of about um, 1.3 million. So that's only about 9%. You mentioned the fleets. I mean, the, the fleets of 10 million cars and 12 million trucks, uh, sorry, 10, 12 million cars and 10 million trucks. By the year 2030, the turnover because of those uh, EV sales will only mean that there's about eight or 9% of the fleet will be electric vehicles in the year 2030. And the other almost 90% Will be about will be uh, still the gasoline or diesel diesel vehicles, and they will be emitting emissions. I, I think, given the attention that this has received publicly, um, it's not just building EV plants. There's also supply chains that are required to scale up as well. And we know now that uh, a lot of attention been paid to the fact that China, for an example. Uh, controls about 80% of critical minerals processing to create batteries. So if we're going to create a supply chain in North America, we not only have to have all the critical minerals, the cobalt, the nickel, the manganese, and lithium, and, and so on, but we have to turn those minerals into batteries, then we have to have we have to turn them into components, and we have to assemble them into, into battery packs, and very little of that supply chain actually exists in Canada. Yeah, and... and to their credit, the federal government and the provincial governments have been trying, they realize that, what you've just said, and they have been trying to encourage companies like Honda, for example, and others to build battery facilities in uh, in Canada. I mean, they made a big announcement in, in my old alma mater's uh, city of Kingston, where they're going to propose to be building a large lithium battery project. But if you do the numbers, I mean, you start to calculate the number of electric vehicles and also freight trucks, which I haven't mentioned. Freight trucks emit far more than, than light trucks and cars because they weigh more and they go farther per year. Uh, there's going to be a huge number of batteries required, and it's going to be a real challenge, as you say, in the supply chain to build hundreds and hundreds uh, of gigawatt hours. That's the unit they use of batteries to, to uh, supply and fuel all those electric vehicles. What about alternate fuels? And we'll talk about renewable hydrocarbons in a moment, uh, renewable diesel. But I just finished a series of interviews in Vancouver with uh, companies that are working in the hydrogen demand space. And a lot of that is around freight trucks. And some of them are working on converting internal combustion engines to, to hydrogen. Uh, there's a pilot project going up in Prince George that will be 50% uh, hydrogen, 50% diesel fuel. Is there any chance that that hydrogen and maybe some other kind of sustainable low carbon fuel might produce gains in the freight trucking sector sooner than you maybe expected? Well, let me break that down. The first is hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, hydrogen is uh, combustible. I mean, you can put it through a, an internal combustion engine and the result is, is H2O, it's just water vapor coming out the back. The challenge is that the what they call the energy intensity of hydrogen, which in English means how many, how many units of energy do you get per kilogram or per pound of, of hydrogen fuel on board is very low. So it makes it very difficult to carry a lot of energy in a truck. Uh, plus you also have to have a supply chain for trucks to, to have hydrogen available literally across the, the country at, on Trans-Canada highways and even off the Trans-Canada highways. So that infrastructure will take a long time. Right now, the infrastructure they're focusing on is charging units and not a lot on, on hydrogen. So that'll be a challenge. The second is fuel cells. That's what the Apollo 11 astronauts used to generate electricity on their spacecraft back in the 60s. That's where you put hydrogen in, uh, in and combine it with oxygen to form water plus electricity. And, and that's a separate way of, of uh, generating power and energy to uh, make fuel truck, to make uh, mostly freight trucks run. 
that's in its infancy. Uh, Nikola, the, the, the company that uh, was in the news a couple of years ago, wants to build those, but I'll be honest with you, I, I think that's a long way away. Well, it, it even if it's a, a short way away, it still doesn't appear that the industry is ready to scale, which I think is a is a critical issue. So if we were to wrap all this up, Brian, how short are we going to be on transportation emissions? And is there anything that either the federal government or provincial governments can do to, you know, to maybe speed it up a bit? Well, they have ZEV mandates, zero emission vehicle mandates. And I always say that a ZEV mandate is also a, a prohibition on the sale of uh, internal combustion engine cars. And that's going to be a challenge. I mean, the feds have come out with some regulations, draft regulations on a federal ZEV mandate. I'll be honest with you, the, the lawyer in me says, I'm, I'm not sure if that's constitutional. I usually thought that cars were a provincial matter. I mean, I look at the cars that I, I and everybody else drive and have all the provincial license plates on the front. So that'll be a challenge. And the second thing is, what are they going to do if they uh, they can't get enough people to, uh, sorry, they can't get enough supply of electric vehicles and there aren't enough vehicles for people to buy the cars and light trucks that they want to buy? That'll be another challenge. You said, what can governments do? They are trying to do. They are trying to encourage the building of electric vehicles. I would like to see governments do exactly what I have done in my forecast, which is come out, and they're supposed to come out on, in 2023 with a a, a status report as to where they are, as to just how many electric vehicles they think are going to be built in the next eight years between now and 2030, year by year, because that's what my study does. does and there's a chart in there that shows that in, in very specific detail. So I would like to have them come out and say, this is how many electric vehicles we think we're going to build. This is the manufacturers that are going to do it. And this is how we're going to encourage more people to do it. You make the point in, in the study that the uh, emissions reduction plan as it stands now is a plan to have a plan. Right. And so uh, so they're going to come out in 2023 with this more uh, detailed plan. But it seems to me that there this has been a feature of, of emissions planning at both the federal and the provincial level for a long time. They announce targets, they announce strategies, they announce these high level kinds of approaches. Uh, without the kind of detailed planning that you've done in, in this study. And maybe that's part of our problem is we put the cart before the horse. You've taken the words right out of my mouth. That's why I did all the studies that I did to try to have some specific evidence, some specific data to say, here's where, based on reasonable assumptions, here's where I think we're going to wind up. You're right. The, the, the policies, uh, the government process has been a political process. It says we have all these wonderful programs and plans, uh, but they never say exactly how they're going to achieve their targets. Uh, I've got a bit of a hobby horse that I've been riding lately, Brian, which is the lack of economic modeling in Canada around these around energy transitions, transition issues. One of them would be, of course, emissions reduction. And it seems to me, like I look down into the United States, and for instance, uh, there are the national laboratories down there, and they do they model all the time so that policymakers have the kind of data and they have the kind of analysis that you've provided in these studies. Uh, they, policymakers have access to that, which makes the, you know, if you're going to plan, uh, having some data and having some scenario modeling is a really good thing. Um, what's your take on the lack of modeling in Canada? And I know we've had this $5 million announcement last year that, that the Canadian energy regulator is going to step up some of its modeling, but that seems to be a real a uh, gap here in, in our approach to emissions reduction. Well, that's why I did what I did. When I spoke to my friends at CD Howe, I said, listen, I think this is a gap in Canada. I don't see any government agency, ECCC or anybody else, putting out num specific numbers with specific assumptions, a specific model that's uh, that's transparent. I'm a great believer in transparency. When I was a kid, my teachers always used to say, Brian, show your work. And so as a result, the presentations that I put together, which are on the CD Howe website, uh, show the work. I would very much like other public policy institutes, if they wanted to, to put together something else. If they've got some better ideas than mine, great. Love to hear about them. Love to hear what different assumptions you make, but please explain why. And in, in my, my uh, document, I try to explain why. You ask, why haven't people done it here in Canada? Uh, governments, I think, aren't, frankly, if you want my honest opinion, 
They aren't always uh, transparent as to how to do things. They talk about what's going to be done, and they love to talk about the programs and the and, and so on that they put together and the policies they put together, but they never actually do the specific work. Why other uh, public policy institutes haven't put together something like this? You'd have to ask them. Well, Brian, thank you very much for this. We'll look forward to the next interview. Thank you, Markham.